Hi, my name is Zan Hecht. I'm a mechanical engineer with Kimball Physics Incorporated, and I'm an alumni of Teams 190 here at uh, WPI and Team 992 in California. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about basic robot design theory. Now, the first thing that most people uh, worry about when they're designing a robot is how is this thing going to actually drive and steer? Well, some robots do use systems like you would see in a car. Uh, you have the front wheels of the robot will swivel left and right in order to drive. However, most robots don't use this system because it's complicated to design and build and has a lot of moving parts. Instead, most of the robots you're going to see in first will look like this. It's a box with four wheels, basically. And these wheels don't pivot left and right. Now, let's look at this robot as it travels in a straight line. It's going to drive from line A here to line B. Uh, as this robot drives in a straight line, you'll notice that the set of wheels on the bottom of your screen there are going to drive in a straight line from A to B, and the wheels on the top drive in a straight line from A to B. So as the robot moves, uh, the wheels on the top are going to move the same distance in the same amount of time that the wheels on the bottom move. And since both sets of wheels are moving the same distance in the same amount of time, the robot's going to travel in a straight line. Now let's look at this same robot as it travels in a curved path. Um, now you notice that both sets of wheels now are going to follow along an arc. And you'll see that the arc followed by the wheels on the bottom here has a smaller radius than the arc that's going to be followed by the wheels on the top. So as this robot moves from line A to line B, the wheels on the top actually move a longer distance than the wheels on the bottom will. This means that the wheels on the top of the robot actually move faster. So therefore, on your robot, if you can independently control the speed of the wheels on the two sides of the robot, you can make it turn. If you have one set of wheels go slower, the robot will move in that direction. And in fact, if you have one set of wheels that drives forwards while the other drives backwards, the robot can actually spin in place. So a drive line like this ends up being much more versatile than a car style steering. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, the specifics of this kind of uh, design as well as other steering systems in the second part of this presentation on drive lines and chassis. Um, however, this kind of steering does have some drawbacks. Let's look again what happens as this robot turns. Uh, here again we have our box on wheels and it's just going to turn from this red position into this blue position. Now when it turns, it's going to turn about some point in the center of the robot, say where this little white dot is here. And watch the paths that the wheels are going to travel. And you'll notice that in addition to turning, the wheels actually have to move sideways. And this ends up being a bit of a problem because wheels are designed so that they have high traction. They don't want to slip because that's how you get um, you know, your wheels spinning in place and not moving if they were to uh, just slip. So since the wheels don't like to slip, trying to turn like this actually ends up being hard if all your wheels have high traction. So as you try to turn, there's a lot of friction, and uh, it ends up, depending on the design of your robot, you end up struggling to turn. And we'll, again, address this a little bit more when you're talking about specific driveline design. Uh, but just be aware there are some drawbacks. Um, now one of the main things that affects uh, the trouble you're going to have turning is what's called the wheelbase. And this is basically how far apart your wheels are. Here on screen, I have two boxes on wheels here. One's long and skinny, um, and the other one's kind of the short, fat robot. And we're going to also have these turn from the red position to the blue position. Now you'll notice, as they turn, the wheels on the long, skinny robot have to move sideways by quite a bit more than the wheels on the short, fat robot. And this just has to do with the fact that you have a larger lever arm on the long, skinny robot. So therefore, if you have a long, skinny robot, there's going to be more resistance to turning because the wheels are going to want to slide sideways by a greater distance. Now, while this does mean it's going to be harder for a long and skinny robot to turn, it does mean that it's going to be harder to drive a short and fat robot straight. So there are drawbacks here. Um, now, there's another effect here with a long and skinny and short and fat robot. With a long and skinny robot, when you're turning, the wheels are moving forward by a shorter distance. With a short and fat robot, to turn at the same amount, the wheels have to drive forward a longer distance. What this means is that tiny movements on the long skinny robot are going to turn it more, so it's harder to get fine turning control. With a short fat robot, you have much greater uh, precise control over turning. Now, when you're actually designing your robot, you have to kind of uh, weigh your options here. Do you want to be able to drive straight really well, 
or do you want to be able to turn really accurately and easily? Uh, here's a picture of two robots. One is a long, skinny wheelbase. Uh, these are both robots from Team 190. Now, the robot on the left here was designed to actually only pretty much drive forward. It would, in autonomous mode, drive straight from its starting position, up a flight of stairs, and hang on a bar all in 15 seconds. Now, because we didn't need it to turn, it was designed to have a very long, skinny wheelbase, and it drove straight really, really well. The problem with this robot is that turning was incredibly difficult when we needed to do it manually. This robot had so much resistance that when you tried to turn, it would actually start hopping up and down as the wheels skipped over the carpet. And if you turn it too fast, the robot would actually tip over. Um, on the other hand, we have this robot that you see on the right here. This is another of 190's robots. This robot had a very short and fat wheelbase. Um, the reason it was that shape was actually because it was designed with a second set of wheels that could drop down and allow this robot to move sideways. Um, but as a result, with this very short, fat wheelbase, it was very hard to drive it in a straight line, but you could get very, very accurate control over turning. So depending on the tasks that you want to perform, you have to balance these two. A short and wide robot will turn easily with lots of control, but they'll tend not to drive straight. On the other hand, a long, narrow robot uh, will not turn easily and have poor turning control, but it's easy to drive it in a straight line very fast. Now, I mentioned before that this uh, long, skinny robot had trouble with tipping. That also, in addition to the fact that its drive line was long and skinny, has a lot to do with where the center of gravity is located. So here I have four sample robots looking from the side here. And I've marked about where the center of gravity of each one is with the little uh, circle with the X in it here. So look at which one of these are good designs. Uh, start with this robot here um, located in the upper left. It's a short box on wheels. The center of gravity is right in between the two wheels here. And this is going to be a very stable design. Now look at the one right below it. Again, the center of gravity is right in between the wheels. The problem is that the center of gravity is very high. So if this robot were to start to, say, go up an incline, as the robot were to tip backwards, uh, what would actually happen is it would get to the point where the center of gravity would tip, and it would tip so much that it would actually be behind the back wheels, and the whole robot would tip over. Um, so basically, it would end up looking somewhat like this robot, where the center of gravity is behind the, uh, or not above the wheels, and this robot would just tip over as soon as you put it on the ground. Uh, finally, we have the robot in the lower right here. And you'll notice the center of gravity is not centered over the wheels. But this actually en doesn't end up being a problem, because it's very low. It's, as you, the robot tips, it's not going to want to uh, tip the robot over. The only consideration is that on this robot, most of the weight is on this back wheel. So you want to have these wheels uh, be your higher traction wheels if you have different types of wheels in your robot. But most robots you'll see will end up having the center of gravity centered above one set of wheels or the other. And this actually makes it easier to turn um, because the robot will tend to turn about a point closest to the center of gravity. Um, and so if it's turning about a point close to where most of the weight is. All right, so we kind of have the basic shape of the robot down. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, the theory of drive lines. Um, on a lot of robots, you'll see chains and sprockets that connect the motors to the wheels. This works very similar to what connects the pedals to the wheel on a bicycle. Uh, but for those of you that aren't familiar with how these work, I'm going to give you a brief rundown here. On screen, I have two sprockets represented by these green things. The one on the left is 16 teeth, and the one on the right is 32 teeth, and they're connected with a chain. Now I'm going to put a little red marker on one tooth of each of these sprockets. Now watch this marker. I'm going to advance the chain one tooth at a time. And you notice as I'm, the chain advances one tooth at a time, the red marker moves forward one tooth position on each of these two sprockets. Now as the sprockets rotate, you notice even though they're both moving one tooth at a time, that the 16 tooth sprocket completes a full revolution in the time 32 tooth sprocket only completes half a revolution. And what this means is that if you have a smaller sprocket connected to a large sprocket by a chain, the smaller sprocket is going to move faster. And the speed that it moves is actually proportional to um, the number of teeth on the input gear, which is the gear that you're driving, uh, divided by the number of teeth in the output gear. This is the gear that would be connected to something like your wheels or a mechanism. So if RPM, the rotations per minute of the output, is equal to the rotations per minute of the input 
times the teeth of the input divided by the teeth of the output. However, you can't get something for nothing. If you use a gear system to increase the speed, what you're going to lose is torque. And torque is basically the equivalent of force for a rotating object. Uh, and this is because your motor, or whatever is driving your chain, has a fixed power, and where power is equal to the speed times the torque. So if you make the speed increase using a chain or a gear, um, you lose torque. And so the equation looks very similar, except it's the opposite. The torque of the output is equal to the torque of the input times the teeth of the output over the teeth of the input. So you have a lot of uh, flexibility here. You can trade off speed if you don't need a lot of power, or you can trade off a lot of pushing power if you don't need to go fast. Now let's talk a little bit uh, quickly while we're on the topics of chains and sprockets about the difference between the two um, types of systems you'll see, sprockets and gears. Now I'm going to go over here and have set up uh, a sp uh, sprocket and chain system on the bottom here and two gears. Now you'll notice the sprockets are connected by a chain. And as I rotate one sprocket, th the other one rotates here. On the top, the two gears mesh directly with each other. As I rotate one gear, the other one rotates. Sprockets and gears are not interchangeable. If I were to take these two sprockets and try to mesh them with each other, it would kind of work, but there's going to be a lot of noise, and there's going to be a lot of what's backlash with this wiggle room, and the teeth aren't really designed for it. You'll probably end up breaking them. Um, either break or they'll just slip past each other. Um, same thing, gears cannot be used to drive chain. Oh, my chain broke. Uh, gears cannot be used to drive chain. Um, they may move a little bit like a belt, but the chain can also slip. Um, so these are not interchangeable. And some other differences as well. Uh, here again, I have in green, I have a sprocket uh, connected by a chain. And in red, I have gears uh, that are meshed with each other. You'll notice as the two sprockets rotate, they're going to rotate in the same direction, as you saw in my demonstration there. Um, if I have the two gears meshed with each other, again, as you just saw in the demonstration, they're going to rotate in opposite directions. Some other differences. Um, the maximum uh, ratio you can get between two sprockets is about 8 to 1. And the reason for this is that you really can't make a sprocket smaller than 9 teeth, because the teeth just don't fit. And you can't make them larger than about 72 teeth, because at that point, the chains will start to slip off the sprocket. Um, so you're limited to this ratio of about 8 to 1. With gears, you can get an infinite gear ratio. Uh, here, I have a drawing of a rack and pinion system. This is similar to what turns the front wheels in your car, where you have a round gear that's actually meshed with a flat gear that's just basically a flat piece of metal with teeth cut into it. And this flat gear could go on as long as you like, so it basically has an infinite number of teeth. So you have infinite possible gear ratios. Um, the number of teeth you're limited to is from 13 to infinity. Uh, although less than 18 teeth is not recommended because the teeth get small and are easy to break. Now, the other difference here um, is when you're actually building uh, either a chain and sprocket system or gear system, what is critical? With a uh, chain and sprocket, the face alignment is critical. Uh, if I go back over to the chain and sprocket I have here, um, if you have these on your, uh, on your robot, if you have these so that the sprockets are not aligned. There's twists like this. As you rotate it, the chain's going to want to pop right off and maybe break. Um, so that's critical with the chain and sprocket. With the gears, what's critical is the spacing away from each other. Uh, if they're too close together, they're going to grind against each other. There's going to be a lot of friction. If they're too far apart, you're only going to be putting the force on the tip of the teeth, and it's either going to slip or you're going to break teeth. Uh, when you're building your robot, it's a lot easier to get the sprockets to be aligned properly because if you have these two sprockets bounded against a flat piece of metal, they'll be aligned. Um, getting uh, Drilling holes to align your gears is much more difficult. So gear systems, because you can get better ratios, can be smaller and lighter than chains and sprockets, but it requires a lot more precision uh, in machining, as opposed to sprockets and chain systems, which are easier to build, but uh, you can't get as much reduction in each stage, and um, they often take up a lot more space. Uh, so these, again, trade-offs you have to weigh when building your robot. Uh, one more thing I'll address uh, here with uh, gears is what's called idler gears. 
Uh, I mentioned before that when you have two gears rotating against each other, they're going to rotate in opposite directions. If you want to change that so they're rotating in the same direction, you put an extra gear in the middle. So you'll see as the gear on the left rotates clockwise, it rotates this next gear counterclockwise, which rotates the final gear clockwise, so that you have a clockwise input and a clockwise output. It turns out that the idler gear doesn't actually affect what the gear ratio is. If you notice in this example, a 16 tooth gear to a 32 tooth gear is a ratio of 2, and then 32 to 32 is a ratio of 1, and you multiply it all together and you get a final gear ratio of 1. Now, if this 32 tooth gear were smaller, say 16 teeth, you do the math again, 16 to 16 is a ratio of 1, 16 to 32 is a ratio of 2, and your total gear ratio is 2. And it turns out that it could be any number of teeth, and it doesn't actually affect the gear ratio. All that affects it is the input gear and the output gear. So let's talk about how you use all this information now to determine the speed of your robot. Well, there's an easy equation to determine the speed of the robot. The speed is equal to the RPM, the rotational speed of the wheel, divided by 60, which gives us rotations per second from rotations per minute, times the diameter of the wheel in feet times pi, which gives us the circumference of the wheel in feet. So we end up with uh, feet per second times, um, sorry, we end up with uh, uh, rotations per second times feet, which gives us feet per second. So the real piece of information we need here is RPM of the wheel. Well, how do we figure out how fast the wheel is turning? Well, let's say we have a sample problem here. What size wheel should I use if I want my robot's maximum speed to be 3 feet per second? What we need in order to solve this is the speed of the motor. Now, if you get an electric motor, you'll probably be able to find specs for it that will have graphs that look like these four on screen here. Now these graphs all have a y-axis um, that varies, and the x-axis of these is all torque. The first graph here is speed versus torque. Now if I have a motor that's just spinning and it's not connected to anything at all, as this motor spins, it'll move very fast because there's no force pushing against it. But it doesn't actually produce any torque. And the reason it doesn't produce any torque is that it doesn't have anything to push against. So this robot, um, sorry, this motor is going to be spinning very, very fast and not producing any torque. And that's what you see on the left side of this graph here, where the torque is zero, but the speed is high. Now, if I grab onto the shaft of this motor, I apply a force to it, it's going to slow it down. So, um, but it's slowing down because I'm applying a torque to it with my hand, and it's applying a torque back. So as the torque graph goes up, the speed goes down, because it's basically, as I'm slowing this motor down, it's producing more torque, but I'm slowing it down. Now, uh, the other side of this is that as I slow this motor down, it has to produce more torque, the amount of current it draws, electrical current, goes up. So this graph is the opposite. The more torque, the more current. Um, actually, it, the motor will eventually get to a point where this doesn't become a straight line anymore, when the motor is what's called install, where it's actually not spinning at all. Uh, when the motor is installed, its resistance effectively drops to zero, and the current goes very, very high, uh, you know, theoretically as high as infinity if it were a perfect uh, theoretical motor. So you have very, very high current, which translates into a lot of heat being generated in your motor, and one of three things will happen. You'll either blow a circuit breaker, you'll burn out your motor, or you'll do both. So you want to prevent your motor from stalling if it's possible. Now, the third graph we're going to look at is this power versus torque. Now, I mentioned before that power is equal to speed times torque. So to get this power versus torque graph, you take this speed versus torque graph, and you multiply this again by the torque. And you get this nice arc. And you'll notice that at the bottom end of the graph, um, which is when the motor is spinning freely, it's moving fast, but there's no torque, so its power is zero. Similarly, when it's in stall, there's a lot of torque at stall, but it's not moving, so there's also zero power. So your peak power is somewhere in the middle here. And the final thing you have to look at is efficiency, uh, which is this graph here. And efficiency is the mechanical power divided, um, that you're getting out of the motor divided by the electrical power you're putting into it. And the electrical power is equal to the voltage, which is your robot is pretty standard at 12 volts, or the current. Um, sorry, the voltage times the current. Um, so you basically have here is the mechanical power, this graph here. Uh, divided by the current graph. And you get uh, this graph, which shows that you have this peak efficiency, which on electric motors tends to be on the low end of the torque range. Now, I will mention when I'm talking about speed here, I'm talking about the motor running at full power. On a first robot, you'll have speed controllers, which effect effectively 
can vary the amount of electrical power, um, so the electrical voltage going to the motor varies from 0 to 12 volts. Um, but these graphs are only showing the speed of the motor running at full voltage. Um, as you reduce the speed but with a speed controller, your output power is going down. So you can't say that as you reduce the speed that way, your torque goes up. But anyway, so you have these four graphs. And let's uh, look at these in a form of a chart here. And this is a sample motor, a uh, small electric motor here. And you'll notice that um, on this chart, as the speed goes down, as you're applying more torque, which is going up, you're drawing more current um, from the motor. And here again, we have the power out. And you'll notice that this, the peak uh, power occurs somewhere between 80 and 90 uh, RPMs here. Um, and the peak power here is about 2.2 watts, mechanical power. And the efficiency, you see the peak efficiency is somewhere around 120 RPMs at about 35%. Now, what happens to the rest, the other 44% of your power? It all goes into heat, which is this last column over here. And you see, as we go down and as we're producing more and more torque, the heat being produced goes um, up and up and up. And the reason, actually, that this graph stops at 57 RPM is on this motor, after you get um, below 57 RPM, you're producing so much heat that you're actually going to damage the motor. But anyway, this motor is a peak efficiency of about 120 RPM. So we're going to use that in our robot speed calculation. Uh, so therefore, we go back to our problem here. And we have uh, our equation filled in with numbers now. Um, we have 3, the final speed of the robot, is equal to 120 RPM divided by 60, which gives us 2 times the diameter of the wheel times pi, which for the sake of argument I'm going to call about 3. So we have 3 equals 6 times the diameter of the wheel. Therefore, the diameter of the wheel is going to be half a foot, or about 6 inches. Uh, therefore, if we use 6-inch uh, wheels on the robot, we're going to have it drive at 3 feet per second. But if the 6-inch wheel is the largest you can fit on the robot, how would we then go about making it drive at, say, 6 feet per second? Well, here we have to go back to what we are talking about before with uh, chains and sprockets. And you can use a chain and sprocket system to reduce the speed of the robot, or sorry, to increase the speed of the robot. You put a sprocket on the motor that's half the size of the sprocket on the wheel, and the wheel's going to move twice as fast, but it's going to have half the torque. Well, that concludes the robot design theory portion of this presentation. In the second half, we'll be going into more specifics about how you actually implement this theory on a robot driveline and chassis.